Welcome back to the AI Breakdown Brief, all the AI headline news you need in five minutes or less. We kick off today with a statistic that has some people surprised. Last month, according to data from SimilarWeb, ChatGPT traffic actually fell. Ever since launching in November of 2022, ChatGPT's traffic has just been up and to the right. The biggest jump came between February and March, when ChatGPT went from about a billion visits per month to more than 1.5 billion visits. Now, since March, it has significantly leveled off. April's growth was much more modest, going up only to around 1.7 billion visits per month, and between April and May, the growth was even less. Now, in June, visits came down to around 1.6 billion per month. So the question, of course, is what's driving this? There was a temptation among some to see it as the ebbing of a hype cycle, and that's certainly possible. However, another possible explanation has to do with what ChatGPT is being used for. Francois Cholet from Google put together a chart that showed search interest over time for ChatGPT on the one hand and Minecraft on the other. The chart shows that towards the middle of May, there's a pretty strict divergence. ChatGPT starts heading down while Minecraft starts heading up. Francois says there's an obvious factor that might well underlie both trends. Down for ChatGPT, up for Minecraft. Can you guess what it is? As it happens, the answer matters for both the future of AI and the future of education. Francois goes on, the answer is of course summer break. Producing homework remains the number one application of LLMs, which is remarkable because the point of homework is to do it yourself. The actual deliverable has zero value to anyone. LLMs are touted as a shortcut to economically valuable deliverables, but the market ends up using them for valueless or negative value deliverables such as homework and content farm filler. Not exclusively, but in very large part. What both homework and content farm filler have in common is that they critically need to sound like they were made by humans. That's the entire point. The content itself is worthless. And that's the fundamental value prop of LLMs, the appearance of human communication. So holding aside for a second the question of whether producing content or doing homework with LLMs is actually a valuable use case, the argument that this is driven by seasonality is pretty compelling. That said, Joe Weisenthal from Bloomberg, who was the person who originally tweeted this chart, was a little more skeptical. He wrote, people are pointing out that there's a seasonality element, which, okay, students need it less in the summer. But I feel like world-changing products that are six months old don't necessarily produce such visible seasonality. Seasonality is for mature things. Now, for my part, I don't super agree with the way that Joe is looking at this. He's trying to pattern match ChatGPT to other previous technologies, but I question whether that's actually something that we can even do. You have to remember that ChatGPT went from 0 to 100 million users in five weeks. The previous fastest platform to 100 million users was TikTok, and it took nine months. Huge amounts of the U.S. population, something like half, have heard of it or actually used ChatGPT. Those are mature product numbers, even if it's not a mature product itself. Point being, I do think it's interesting that we have this decline in numbers, but I'm simply not sure that we can draw a lot of conclusions from how other platforms previously worked. Another possible explanation is that there's simply some amount of market saturation happening. ChatGPT may be down in June compared to April and May, but its use is still astronomical compared to basically any other service ever compared to how old it is. Still, I do think it's a trend worth tracking. There is the possibility that there is a hype cycle ebbing, and I think to some extent as a content creator, I'm certainly feeling a little bit of that. But then again, hype cycles ebbing is not necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, it's a natural part of any new technology settling into what is going to become its real long-term use cases. Now, staying on the theme of OpenAI for just one more moment, earlier this week they tweeted, we've learned that ChatGPT's browse beta can occasionally display content in ways we don't want e.g. if a user specifically asks for a URL's full text, it may inadvertently fulfill this request. We are disabling browse while we fix this. We want to do right by content owners. Basically what happened here is that people were figuring out how to use ChatGPT's browse features to get around paywalls. That's exactly the type of thing that publishers and existing establishment companies are terrified of when it comes to AI. And so, of course, OpenAI is racing to close that loophole. Speaking of AI and content, however, there was a bunch of different news around publications turning to AI to develop a new content strategy going forward. FutureSim is reporting that last week, CNET owner Red Ventures held an all-hands meeting where their CEO, Rick Elias, laid out a plan for how AI was going to shape their entire future. In that meeting, Elias said, Today is day one of AI in our company. Today is the day that we will look back on, hopefully five to ten years from now, and realize this was not just an opportunity for us to open up a new revenue source or our new business source, but to truly reinvent everything we do as a company. AI will change everything, and I believe, for the most part, in a good way. Now, this is not the first dust-up with AI that CNET has had. Earlier this year, after publishing an article that was absolutely riddled with errors written by AI, 
CNET staff decided to unionize, saying that the use of AI, quote, threatens our jobs and reputations. A representative said, quote, We're joining a lot of others in the media who are looking into how to address AI in relation to plagiarism, liability, and the impact to the workforce. Now, how then Red Ventures and CNET are thinking about how they're going to use AI in the wake of both those errors and the unionization is not exactly clear. In a statement that they emailed to FutureSim, a representative said, We believe it will impact every facet of modern work and help humans do uniquely human work better. We're embracing it. We are upskilling our teams. We're exploring how it can help us better serve our customers and partners, but we're committed to doing it the right way. Which, as you can probably tell, doesn't say much of anything at all. Another interesting story along the same lines comes from Gio, who owns Gizmodo, The Root, Quartz, and other publications. Daily Beast reporter Corbin Bollies tweeted out, Geo Media Editorial Director Merrill Brown tells staff the company will begin testing AI-produced stories based around lists and data next week. The source was an email from Merrill Brown with the subject line, Innovating Geo Media. The email starts, Editorial Team, I am writing to advise you of a new content feature that will be added into the mix at Geo Publications. It shouldn't be a surprise that we've done a significant amount of thinking about artificial intelligence, just as everyone in the media business has been doing of late. We're convinced here that the changes AI will bring to the media and journalism worlds will be very meaningful, if difficult to predict with certainty. Now, Brown goes to pains to say that these new trials will not impact human written content, saying, These features aren't replacing work currently being done by writers and editors, and we hope that over time, if we get these forms of content right and produced at scale, AI will, via search and promotion, help us grow our audience. Now, it might be hard to imagine that investing more in AI-produced content won't have implications for what journalists and writer these publications hire. And staying on the theme of work, the first law in America that regulates AI bias in hiring has taken effect in New York City just today. Basically, the law requires that employers who are using AI and other algorithmic tools to make hiring or promotion decisions have to disclose that they're doing so. These companies are also mandated to undergo annual audits for potential bias in the AI process. And while it seems like people who are concerned about AI bias might be excited about this law, it's actually been critiqued for not being strong enough. Ben Winters, who leads AI and human rights at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, said, quote, there's a real concern that good governance tools like audits and impact assessments regarding AI programs become this administrative wand waving in front of your face. A court's piece cites a Federal Trade Commission complaint against HireVue, who hired independent auditors to investigate bias in its product and then issued a press release saying that those auditors had found no bias risks. However, if you actually looked at the audit, apparently, the auditors didn't say that the tool is unbiased, just that auditors didn't have enough information. Finally today, one of the coolest AI uses that I've seen for a while, a group of archaeologists and computer scientists has teamed up to create AI software that can translate cuneiform tablets from ancient Akkadian, a dead language, into modern language and to do so pretty instantaneously. Now, Akkadian, the language of Sumeria, is one of the best preserved languages in the form of hundreds of thousands of cuneiform tablets that have been unearthed and discovered around the world over the past several centuries. However, the process of actually translating that into something that we understand is immensely difficult. One of the challenges, for example, is that Akkadian is polyvalent. That means, as Big Think puts it, cuneiform signs can have several different readings depending on how each one functions in a sentence. Because of that, translating Akkadian is actually a two-step process. First, cuneiform signs have to be transliterated. In other words, they have to rewrite the cuneiform in similar-sounding phonetics of the target language. The second step is taking that transliteration and then translating it into a modern language. The AI model that they developed has scored extremely well. Both scores, Big Thing says, were above their target baseline and in the range of a high-quality translation. In addition, Big Think writes, there was a surprising result. The model was able to reproduce the nuances of each test sentence's genre. The team writes, quote, In almost every instance, whether the translation is proper or not, the genre is recognizable. There's something quite cool to me about the idea of the most cutting-edge technology we have, helping preserve human knowledge and information from thousands and thousands of years ago. That's going to do it for today's AI Breakdown Brief. If you're enjoying it, please share it with someone you think might be interested, and I'll be back soon with the main AI Breakdown.